thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, uh, so I was invited to talk about uh, zebra fish nutrition as a variable in Europe. I wasn't actually sure what to report on. So um, Stephen and Zoltan encouraged me to do a small survey of, uh, through the mailing list of the European um, um, Society for Fish Models in Biomedicine, you fish biomed, and uh, maybe I should uh, um, introduce that. So it's a regional society um, of uh, zebra fish labs that um, um, uh, corresponds to the International Zebra Fish uh, uh, um, IZFS, IZFS um, International uh, Federation of uh, Zebra Fish Scientists, but um, acts on a regional level. And um, uh, so, uh, and this complements the survey that um, Zoltan will report on later on in the um, um, lunch session. Um, so, uh, we mailed approximately 500 labs. Um, the uh, mailing list of EOFish Biomed um, uh, contains um, more or less all zebra fish labs in Europe. Uh, we received only a small number of replies. Uh, it was all, also only just a short time. Uh, in total, we have 27 replies. So obviously, that's a highly self-selected sample of uh, laboratories that are interested uh, in this issue. Um, uh, also, not from all European countries. There were, were no responses from Britain. I'm not sure why that is so. Um, but uh, still, I think there are some, some uh, sir? It's not in Europe anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, but um, Turkey yeah, is not in the EU, and Israel is not in the EU. And, uh, um, maybe so. Um, but uh, I think there are some uh, interesting answers which I would like to, to share with you. Um, so, um, what feeds do people uh, use? Um, uh, so a wide range of dry feeds is uh, used, and all of these are commercial. Uh, none of the uh, labs that responded uh, make their, their own food, and they include major manufacturers of um, pet store uh, commercial food like JBL, Sarah, um, Tetra, and um, uh, laboratory suppliers. Um, uh, the only thing that was clear is that uh, Gemma, uh, by spreading, is the most popular, which was used by about half of it's used by about half of the labs. Um, then also fairly popular is Sparrows. I think we have people from Sparrows listening in yeah. to the meeting. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, then there are quite a number of other other suppliers, uh, some of which. Uh, Maybe popular in the US as well, I don't know about that. And um, interestingly, 33% uh, of the labs, one third of the labs combine multiple brands of dry food. Uh, that is um, presumably uh, to uh, um, uh, even out uh, differences, um, per perceived um, uh, uh, differences be between uh, foods from feeds from uh, individual manufacturers. In fact, we use feed from two manufacturers as well at the EZRC. Um, most labs supplement um, dry feed with Artemia uh, uh, with, uh, and other uh, live feeds, but mostly Artemia, which is used by about three quarters of the labs, which is also uh, recommended by Eufish Biomed. Um, uh, rotifers, uh, we are in the process of, of testing rotifers now. Um, so some labs use rotifers as well as paramecia. Uh, um, uh, bloodworms, i.e. Chironomus larvae, are used by one lab, spirulina, tetramina. Um, just as an example, and it's, uh, what, that's what we do with this protocol, uh, also published in the, the husbandry, uh, a special issue of um, zebra fish uh, that uh, appeared a couple of years ago. Uh, so this is just a, an example of a very pr uh, traditional protocol that we use uh, successfully at the ZRC and have not changed it because it works well, uh, which is based on uh, a caviar uh, a commercial food and um, this protocol was originally imported um, as an 
example how this happened was originally in polio to our lab uh, from the uh, Strasbourg fish facility and um, and we continue to use it because it worked well uh, so um, uh, different uh, sizes of cambio food are used uh, supplemented with artemia and for adults uh, with tetramine flakes so part of what we feed is, is flake food and of course, as you see, this is a rather complex protocol. There are quite a number of um, factors that uh, could be optimized if one wanted to optimize them systematically. So this was all done by trial and error. And well, it, some aspects have been tested and, and it works quite well. And so we use that at the moment. Um, now, uh, do labs think that feed variability is an issue, and it turned out that most people do not, uh, who responded, do not see that as an issue for their own research. Uh, either they don't see it at all as, a, as an issue for their research. Do you have a point here? You bet. <laughs> oh, this doesn't work. So, um, can I find for the mouse? Anyway, see, so uh, uh, the um, uh, labs in, in gray say it's not, not an issue at all for the kind of experiments they are doing. Um, then uh, there are two labs that said it's not an issue for us because we've established an internal standard for our lab, uh, which of course uh, makes it difficult to compare to what other people are doing to for reproducibility. Um, then there are the people. Um, but how about the people who say, yes, feed variability is an issue, or they say it could, in principle, be an issue for zebrafish research, just not for what we are doing at the moment. Um, and uh, that category, again, would include us at the ZRC because we're mainly interested in growing up and producing fish. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, it, uh, it can be an issue for things like uh, uh, screening assays uh, that we also use. And, um, uh, among the responses to Italian labs, I uh, wanted to point out um, uh, that it would be helpful to use feeding devices such as the blowfish device, which they have developed, um, which is a feeding device for flake food that's pneumatically operated and uh, that is uh, that can help to feed consistent amounts. Of course, this is just an example. There are, we've seen already, robotic uh, 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 devices and others, um, but uh, it's just to point out that um, uh, feeding a consistent amount is a major issue for zebrafish, especially since zebrafish tend to, to uh, fatten and uh, um, get obese and sterile if they are fed at limitum in contrast to other organisms, animal organisms. Um, so, uh, big question, what do people think about an open formulation, chemically defined food. And uh, the, um, about how the people think that, it, that this would be useful. And um, at some point, uh, it would be specifically useful for experiments involving, obviously, metabolism and uh, uh, toxicolo metabolomics, toxicology, ecotoxicology, and so on. Um, and uh, a number of arguments uh, were, were conducted in favor of a chemically defined food that, will, well, that having uh, a food with known and, if possible, low pollutant content. Uh, then uh, it was pointed out that commercial food, one person believes, is too, generally too high in protein. Um, that it would be useful to be able to boost specific nutrients for in order to produce, for example, better quality oocytes um, uh, by uh, changing nutrient uh, conditions on, on uh, the top of the standard uh, uh, concentration um, that would be given in the um, defined food and also obviously to, to, to improve reproducibility. There were also a number of arguments against. Uh, there is a general feeling that live food is crucial for health of zebrafish, and uh, there are fears that uh, chemically defined food could be potentially expensive. And of course, as one person pointed out, never change the running system. So um, uh, there will be some resistance um, as well. Um, we also asked labs whether they would be willing to test such a food if it became available. Um, uh, 16 of the labs uh, said they would be willing to test uh, a, a, a chemically defined feed uh, that 
even include one of the labs who said they don't see, see a reason to have it in the first place, that, but they will test it, will test it if it became available, and some point out that their capacity for setting up uh, a controlled experiment, such as setting up um, XPRX fish for that purpose. Um, finally, and that's already the, the end of uh, this, this survey, uh, since this was organized by Youthfish Biomed, uh, we asked whether uh, the society should get involved in an effort to standardize uh, feeds, for example, that could include a white paper, and there was overwhelming support for that, with only um, uh, one uh, person um, uh, being against it. Um, that uh, person uh, cautioned, and uh, I put this at the, at the bottom of the slide, before standardizing, you would have to make a quantitative comparison of different feeding protocols that are being used in different places to see what really works best, and to do this properly would be a huge effort. And I'm not sure this is worth it, except for labs working specifically on metabolomics or related issues. And uh, yeah, so obviously, uh, require require a, a large amount of experiments as we've seen already this morning and um, I think EU fish biomed could uh, be involved in um, uh, popularizing chemically um, defined diets and um, making them available to labs and um, uh, Creating a feeling in the community that such libraries, that, that such feeds, that such, such diets are needed. Um, Eufish Biomet probably doesn't have the resources to do a lot in, in experimentally uh, uh, evaluating and, and helping to develop such diets. And I should also point out that Eufish Biomet has published a white paper, it's now also published as a paper on zebra fish husbandry. Uh, which should help regulatory authorities in Europe as well as um, labs, uh, especially labs starting to work on uh, uh, zebra fish. And um, these um, guidelines con do contain uh, uh, a paragraph on feeding, and that is very vague, and in part it is purposely very vague because uh, the people working on uh, these guidelines, um, Alice Trimit, I uh, saw a problem in being too restrictive because um, European authorities, several different authorities in several countries, would uh, uh, perhaps um, take the opportunity to take away um, freedom from laboratories. If uh, the guidelines say you have to feed whatever three times a day, then uh, everybody will be uh, um, compelled to do that, and uh, one shouldn't um, be too specific in formulating uh, such guidelines with uh, uh, um, thinking of, of the, the potential regulatory ramifications, um, unless uh, there are very good reasons to, to formulate the guidelines in that way. So uh, one has to be very careful in, in that respect in, in what uh, to, to propose and, and um, and how to, to write up guidelines for feeding. And they will also apply to chemically defined feeds, which are probably not good for everyone. Okay, and that's the end of what I was going to say already. And I would like to thank people from uh, EU Fish Biome to help with the survey and uh, of the IDG EZRC fish facility. And Uwe Schrell, the head of EU Fish Biome. Thanks. Your time some questions. We were saying the open formula chemically defined diet. Chemically defined diet is not a natural ingredient diet. Did you mean yeah, you know, diet made from yes, the basic uh, nutrient components like uh, fatty acids, start with fatty acids and amino acids. You're not talking about a semi-purified diet. Or are you talking about a natural, when you say chemically defined, yeah, okay. nutrients are defined? Yeah, well, uh, 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 um, the, the way the survey was put, I think chemically defined diet is, as we heard today, one where the individual, a purified diet, where the individual uh, um, components are purified. But, um, yeah, obviously, when you try to, to standardize feed, I think that is a, a, something that should be done definitely. I mean, 
seen how far uh, backwards we are in the zebra fish field compared to, um, to aquaculture. As was pointed out today, um, uh, one should have both, and um, yeah, other works to be done there. So, okay. so I, I think you're hitting the nail on the head, as we would say in Germany. Um, when we engage in a project that could last 20 years, oh, I, I think, and different communities come, come together. Obviously, the language we speak is not the same. And I think it's really, really important that there is um, some sort of effort put into a common language that we understand whether we really mean chemically defined or laboratory defined or whatever we do. So for the later discussion this afternoon, this should be something we should put into the pathway for developing a standardized food, how, you know, the nutrition com uh, community and the zebrafish community, you know, exchange information and agree on terms. <laughs> I think yeah. some like some of the result, uh, some of the responses yeah. to the quest questionnaire yeah. Yeah. will really highlight uh, some of the challenges we're going to yeah. face. Yep. Um, and speaking from my perspective, um, in our facility, we've got maybe 15 labs that use zebrafish, and I'm probably the only one that um, does anything past five days. So you know, any analysis done when they're independently fed you know, one of these diets for the experimental fish. And I should imagine there's going to be like a lot of resistance to changing things um, because I would imagine other, if you're looking at one day old embryos, the majority of people would be like, if the fish are growing, you know, at a reasonable rate and producing enough embryos, don't change anything. So I think that's going to be, for me, at my facility, that's going to be a big problem implementing sure. some of this. Yeah, I think probably you can't, you can't force zebra fish labs to use something specific but, and they yeah. wouldn't want to be forced by authorities either, that's uh, well, referred to. But um, uh, I mean, still, I think the um, survey results are encouraging in that um, a lot of people do see, in, in Europe at least, do see uh, a need to standardize in some way, and that would probably not be chemical, not be def chemically defined uh, a feed, but um, to have uh, um, guidelines, especially if you start a new lab, you want some sort of guidance. You don't want to, to start from the beginning by trial and error, and um, so it, it, uh, that there is a need for some, some help to be given to, to labs, and some would adopt the guidelines and some wouldn't. Well, I think it also highlights the need for education yeah. because we are scientists and many of our colleagues that are developmental biologists which kind of founded the system don't get or aren't aware of the body of literature on the subsequent effects downstream. For example, there's tons of developmental biologists working on beta cell development and the beta cell number. Now we have data that thinks we know of epigenetic changes that occur and maybe their own research there, whatever sets the number of beta cells could have be affected by the kinds of diets that the mother uh, or the parents had. So I think there's a lot of biology that, that suggests that maybe there are things that people are studying that they think are independent are actually affected by these husbandry questions. And I think this is an education. So I think if our colleagues, uh, uh, if we communicated the importance and what we know about how the microbiome changes and what we know, that may open up more possibilities because many of folks just think this embryo and that yolk are just the same in every embryo, not the idea that the yolk lipids make up the lipids that mom ate and changing those things change their embryo. So yeah, I guess I'm just agree. arguing there's an education component to all the ways that these things affect what these developmental biologists do not perceive right now as important. Okay, with that we'll